It was my privilege some years ago to travel to the land of China. And while I was there, I did very little sightseeing. We were seeking to minister to the saints there. But we did take time to go to the Forbidden City in Beijing and to see the largest temple precinct, I think, maybe in the world. I think there may be one larger at Xi'an in China, but uh, massive. And uh, while we were there, it's, uh, it's 674 acres. And uh, while we were there, we were taken to see the great altar. And this altar was an earthen altar, much like the Israeli altars. And uh, we were told, now our guide, the, the person who was telling us the story, was a communist. But she was explaining that originally the people of China were monotheists. And the Chinese people, as you know, have a very ancient history. They trace their first dynasty back to within one generation of the Tower of Babel. Now, there are only a handful of original writings or, or kinds of writing in history. The Egyptian hieroglyphs, Sumerian, and so on. Uh, the writing in the Indus Valley. And Chinese is the only one of these ancient writing styles that is still active today. And I'm not going to spend time on it, but you can do a little research and find books written showing that the message of the gospel is actually embedded in the Chinese characters. Everything from the word for boat being a vessel with eight people or eight mouths. We speak about having how many mouths to feed, and that's how the Chinese speak about people. And so eight is now their good luck number, but it links itself back to this ancient picture of the eight Noah's family that were rescued at the time of the flood. The word for a garden is an enclosure, and inside the enclosure, we have uh, these two people and the trees. And so it's a fascinating study. I'm not going to go into it now. But what I want to tell you is that as we were standing there listening to this woman, she began to explain to us how originally the people who came to China and established the first dynasty, they worshipped a god whom they called Shandi or Shanti, uh, which means the, the Supreme One. And uh, this person was worshipped, or at least there were rituals held for this person, at this great altar. And they called it the border sacrifice. And actually they worshipped the God who lived over there, thinking towards the Middle East. They didn't believe that this God inhabited this altar or this temple. He Sometimes the title given to him is simply the one in heaven. Heaven was used interchangeably, as we would say, heaven help us, in the sense of God himself. And actually the word for heaven, Tian, is a word that speaks of the man above. The man above. So, Anyway, as she explained this to us and told us that they had held this border sacrifice for 4,000 years through 18 dynasties until 1911. And at this time, the emperor would have a time of fasting. The, the animal was taken, was examined to make sure that it had no flaws it passed through the gates of hell on its way to sacrifice, as if there was this idea of substitutionary judgment by which the people could be saved. And as I listened to her explain this idea, history tells us that this altar, 654 sacrifices were carried out there by... Um, 22 emperors, approximately 500 years. 
that he celebrated this. Now, no doubt over the centuries, much of the truth was lost. And yet this notion that there was one God who was a transcendent God, he didn't live on earth, he wasn't worshipped in, in houses of, built of stone and wood, but he was the supreme God. And in actual fact, the emperor was called upon to write a, a prayer. Now here's an excerpt from Emperor Jia Jing from AD 1522 to 1566. He writes, O oh, awesome creator, I look up to you. How imperial is the expanse of heavens. I reverently honor you. Your servant, I am but a reed or willow. My heart is but that of an ant. Yet have I received your favoring mandate appointing me to the government of the empire. I deeply cherish a sense of my ignorance and foolishness and am afraid lest I prove unworthy of your abundant grace. Therefore will I observe all rules and statutes, striving, insignificant as I am, to be faithful. Far distant here, I look up to your heavenly palace. Come in your precious chariot to the altar. Your servant, I bow my head to the earth, reverently expecting your abundant grace. And so he goes on. Your servant, I prostrate myself to meet you and reverently look up for your coming, O D. Oh, that you would promise to accept our offerings and regard us while we worship you, because your goodness is inexhaustible. The notion that people slowly crawled out of polytheism and pantheism into monotheism is absolutely not true. Anthropologists who have done their studies in the most primitive cultures, the, the earliest cultures, like Tierra del Fuego, the south end of South America. Going back to the earliest civilizations, every one of them were monotheists in their religion. And so when the scripture says that God may be known, that he manifested himself to them, he showed himself to them, and for this reason, they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So this is a tremendous resource for the child of God. As the Chinese rise in the world and become the dominant economy in the world, and as Chinese people spread across the planet, God is using Christians in wonderful ways to reach these people who are curious about their own history, to understand that their culture is rooted in monotheism, not atheism, not polytheism, but in monotheism, and that the supreme God was the God that they worship, the creator of all, the transcendent one, the gracious one, as this emperor said, your goodness is inexhaustible. It was a strange, mind-bending experience for me to hear this woman explaining about the shedding of blood and the necessity of the animal going through the gate of hell in order to provide a salvation for the people. And the idea that this one supreme God would deign to come and meet with them. It was, it was amazing to see. And so get familiar with this. If you have Chinese friends, um, there are books available that explain how the gospel is embedded in the Chinese characters. That the Chinese originally came from the Tower of Babel when the nations were scattered. And within one generation, they established their first dynasty in the land of China. And this is the only ancient pictograph language that is left. Nobody uses uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs today or Sumerian or whatever it might be. Even Greek and, uh, and Latin are defunct. But here is a language that has been preserved and the gospel is embedded in it. So be encouraged. When you see the rise of China, don't listen to these fear mongers. 
God is at work. The Chinese people have gone in 1900 from about a million Christians to perhaps a hundred million today. And God is at work mightily, not only in the Chinese in China, but the Chinese around the world who are bumping into Christians, who are able to reintroduce them to the God that their ancestors once worshipped, the one true and only creator, and the one who deigned to come down and provided himself as the sacrifice. And so I encourage you to do a little research and to share these glorious truths with your Chinese friends, that they too might rediscover this glorious being who loves the Chinese. Just one last comment. My father went to China about 10 years before I was there, and he sent a postcard home. And all it said was, dear kids, one billion souls loved above, dead overwhelmed at the thought that every one of these was loved from the heart of God. What a wonderful God we worship. This one true God who has manifested himself to the whole world. And God's objection is not that people don't know him, but that when they do know him, they don't acknowledge him as God. We have the privilege of showing our friends the reality of God in our own lives. And as we do that, we are able to introduce them to our best friend, the God of heaven.